Our Heavenly Father, how wonderful those words are and how true that is. Lord, you are the one who rescues us. Lord Jesus, you, you died for us so that we might indeed be rescued from Satan, sin, and death, that we might have new life in Christ. And Lord, we give you all praise and glory and honor for that. Apart from your grace and mercy and love, we would have no hope. But because you love us, Lord, you did everything for us that we could not do for ourselves. And Father, we, we thank you, we praise you, we quiet our souls, and we stand in awe of you. I thank you for this day, for this opportunity that we have as a church to celebrate the work that you are doing. And Father, I ask and pray that your Holy Spirit would move and speak to each of us. And Father, I pray for everyone here I pray, Father, that there would be no one who would, quote, tune out because they're not a deacon being ordained. But, Father, you have called all of us to serve out of our giftedness. And so I ask and pray that this would be a holy time for the entire church, God. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. It is good to see you this morning. And just a few little housekeeping things on the front end so you'll know. Okay? I've been already asked hey, what are we doing with masks and not masks? And you see, well, the Saturday group has made an organic decision by themselves, okay? And that was very natural. And we've been praying about this for some time. And so I, we're going to be talking with our leaders tomorrow, but I got a gut feeling we're going to come down on mask optional. So just uh, whatever the Lord wills on that, there will not be a, an imitation day too. I need to let you know that. This service is a celebration time today. And not that imitations interfere with that, but we're doing something very special. So if you have uh, any questions about how to connect with Christ, what that means to follow Jesus, about the gospel, about God, how to connect with his church, please send an email to us at info at stonebridgesa.com, info at stonebridgesa.com, that's everybody here, because we're going to be doing something different when we close the service today, and you'll see that in a moment. There will also be uh, no announcements. Folks, we are entering into three weeks of celebration, and that's amazing to me, and we need to celebrate. This is a day of celebration. And guys, if you don't remember this, you better quickly. Next week is a celebration too. It's called Mother's Day. Don't forget that. We're going to celebrate the women in our church. The women, the mothers, the grandmothers, okay? You're going to want to be here for that, okay? And then the third week, we're having another celebration. God has been good to us. He has provided for us. This church is out of debt. And he also gave us the extra education space that we needed so that as the Lord continues to work and build his church, that idea of us being able to have a second Sunday service will become a possibility for us to be praying. We have a lot to pray about. We have a lot to celebrate. So today, we're going to celebrate, okay? Because the Lord is at work. He always is working. Sometimes we just don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. And in many ways, last night in the message, I wrestled. I thought, man, this is, I would love to preach that and this. But you don't want to hear two sermons today. So why don't we, I don't, well, yeah, you just gave me a look like you're not going. No, we're not. But I want to say something that I'm asking you all because you're here. Saturday's group covenanted to pray about, with us about something very specific. We're going to be focusing on deacons today, so I'm going to ask you to be praying about something as a church, everybody in the church, okay? Be praying about certain needs that we have. First of all, I want you to pray with me, please, and write these things down. Enter them on your phone, whatever you have to do. Would you please start praying now, Lord, where do you desire for me to serve in the life of this church? Because everyone who is a member, everyone who is saved is saved to serve. And you've been given spiritual gifts. So, Lord, what do you want from me? And I'm going to ask you to persist in that prayer until the Lord shows you and draws you and breaks your heart towards that thing or things. Can we do that? Okay. Second thing, I want you to pray for very specific needs. These are good things. As we ramp things back up on campus and as people start to feel more comfortable, we need more children's workers. Not warm bodies, but children's workers. And Scott, it comes to Saturday nights. And so if you have anything, please pray for children's workers. We also are going to need a new Awana commander. We're going to be missing the fosters very much. And you know what? The Lord has raised up Awana commanders 
And then they call, they get called away. But you know what he's been doing it was amazing? Every time he raises up somebody else. And you never know what that's going to look like. So please pray for that. We also need a high school youth Sunday school teacher. That's a very important, important thing. You pray for that. And we also need a young married adult Sunday school teacher. John's class is actually more of the median adult class. And we need someone who's going to be able to focus on young married. I mean, young ones of young kids. So we can have our three adult classes so that we can properly group people. And I also want you to be praying about the worship ministry as they've been in a process of praying and we're inviting everybody who's interested in singing and, and playing. And if you play an instrument, to come Tuesday at 6.15 and pray about, are you called into that? And here's what I'm going to tell you what I told last night. Some of you didn't write any of this down because you thought, oh, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. No. You pray about that. Because you know what the Lord has a tendency of doing? Breaking your heart and you're saying, well, Lord, Lord, me, do that? Yeah, that's my will for you. We have some people right now who are serving in some areas that they never would have envisioned and God broke their heart and they are so filled with joy because they stepped out with trembling and fear into that area. So you pray, amen, about those areas. And if we're all doing that together, God's gonna provide. There's a mini sermonette. Right? Today is deacon ordination. And if you're wondering what that means, well, it's a little bit of background so you can understand. And we're going to look at a little text. And, and, and so in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, and when we know this throughout the New Testament, there are really only the only officers, officers or rather, that are mentioned in the new, local New Testament church are pastors and deacons. And these uh, are, are, are placed in, 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 in place by the local congregation uh, through this service of ordination. And we have the model in Acts chapter 6. This is where deacons come into being. This is where we get our idea of ordination. So in, in, in uh, I almost said deacons chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. My words aren't working well today, which is not good. Um, please read with me verses 1 through 6. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Not that there's anything wrong with serving tables, but they knew we cannot do our job and do that at the same time. We can't do our calling and do that. And guess what? That's still true today. Everybody has a role. Everyone has a role. And when everybody in God's church is serving out their role, it's beautiful. And those needs are met. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Godly men filled with the Spirit, called out, set apart, prayed over, and given to this ministry of serving others. That's what a deacon is. A deacon is one who serves the practical needs in the church so that the other officers, your pastor elders, can focus on our calling. And when all of those things are happening together, that is beautiful. It's wonderful. The pastors are freed up to focus on our little, our, our, our lane, so to speak, and the deacons are focusing on theirs. And as each of you are serving out of your giftedness in the roles that God has called you to, guess what? The people of God are being equipped. The kingdom is advancing. People are growing in maturity, and the gospel will move, advance forward, and the church will grow in maturity and in numbers. That's when you know God's people are functioning correctly. So the idea that any of us have a particular gifting in which my gift is to sit, soak, and sour and observe, that's not a gift. We're all saved to serve. And the deacons were called out because there was this very specific need that was harming the church. 
the very first dispute broke out in the early church. We, we tend to idealize the early church and think that it was perfect. No, it was filled with imperfect people saved by grace, and they had very real challenges and problems. And one of those were the Hellenists. These were Jewish women who had come to faith in Christ, but they had adopted the, the Greek culture. They felt that they were being neglected, these widows. And they felt like, well, the, the Jewish uh, women who speak Hebrew, they're getting better treatment than us. And you can see how that could harm the church. And this is where deacons are birthed. Now, in the New Testament, there is no prescribed procedure for a service of ordination other than really what we see in Acts 6. It's the setting apart, laying hands on, praying over. That's what we see in the Word of God. Now, the word deacon, you might say, well, what, I think it's important for you to know. What, is it, what does a deacon do and what does that word mean? Deacon literally means servant or even more literally waiting man. I don't call, don't call deacons here, hey, waiting man, don't do that. But the idea is that a deacon is not a ruler, he is a servant. He is a serve. To serve the very practical needs in the church. The only passage that mentions when we get to the qualifications of a deacon, and this is the one we're going to, the text we're going to un, 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 unpack today a little bit. The only passage that we see where there's qualifications for deacons is 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Why don't you turn there or turn your Bible app to that? 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. This is where Paul gives this official, but it's not an exhaustive list for the requirements of deacons. Now, on the front end, as we read this text, please know this. Just like when you look at the qualifications for elders, this list of requirements does not imply perfection. If that were the case, no one would be serving anywhere, okay? It does refer in the broad sense, this is the type of literature we're looking at in the Greek, of, a, of being a person who has moral, spiritual integrity, strong Christian maturity, who's guarding the unity of the church. And so we're going to take a look at nine qualifications for deacons in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. I'll read the text, and then we'll just take a look at each qualification. Does that sound okay? I'll assume it to be Yes. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, nor greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So let's take a look at these nine qualities, nine qualifications of a deacon. First, he must be, in verse 8, dignified. Now, this word, this term normally refers to something that is honorable, respectable, esteemed, this is also one of the qualifications of an elder. And so a deacon must be an honorable person, an honorable servant. He is also, the second quality, he's not to be double-tongued. It's also verse 8. Now, wait, what, what does that mean? Double-tongued is when you say one thing to certain people and then something else to another people, or, uh, or you say one thing but you mean another, meaning they're two-faced and insincere. Their words can't be trusted, so they lack credibility. So a deacon is to be trustworthy. He is also, three, to not be addicted to much wine. Verse 8, a man is disqualified for the office of deacon if he is addicted to wine or other strong drink because such a person lacks self-control, and the issue there is the addiction. We are to be filled with the Spirit, not drunk with wine. He is also, fourth, in terms of his quality, to not be greedy for dishonest gain. Now, this is actually, in the context, it refers to abusing your office or position or anything because you love money. It's greed. So if a person is a lover of money, he's not qualified to be a deacon, especially since often deacons are involved in financial aspects and matters of the church. He has to be, five, sound in faith and in life. That's verse 9. And Paul indicates there that he must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That's what he's talking about. That means a few things. One, the deacon is to be biblically sound. 
He's to know the word of God. And so the deacon is to be a person like all Christians, who dives into the Word of God and is shaped by the Word of God and is to have a life that reflects that. In other words, he is to be a doer of the Word. He wants to live out what he sees in Scripture. When Paul uses the phrase, the mystery of faith, it's simply another way that Paul would refer to the gospel. So that also means that deacons must hold firm to the true gospel and not waver. And you know what? In the days that we live in, What an important issue, not only for deacons, but for pastors and for everyone, because there are so many other gospels in our culture right now. Deacons, I charge you. Brothers, I charge you. Church, I charge you. You hold faith to the once and for all historic gospel. Don't waver from it. Don't be ashamed of it. Proclaim it boldly and in love. Know it. Build your life on it. So for that to happen, the deacon has to know the gospel. He must be a doer of the word, not just to hear. But it's, it's not just merely the beliefs, because Paul says he's to hold these with a clear conscience. That's the interesting part. And so what does that mean? What that means, and this is something for all of us, because we go to James, but this is a qualification for a deacon. It's not this that you know. It's important for us to know. Sometimes we do a disservice and we say, oh, that's just all head knowledge. And they have, no, th- that knowledge is important because that's truth. But that knowledge needs to sink here and it needs to sink into here and needs to be a part of who we are, how we flesh that out. So if it just stops here, that's not what God calls us to. If it goes into here, that's good, but that should lead it for us to do it. Does that make sense? So that's what the deacon is to be. The sixth qualification in verse 10 sounds really scary. He's to be blameless. Now suddenly, every man who ever thought about being a deacon said, wait a minute. Not me, and I have a few questions too. Who's blameless? Okay, Paul writes that deacons must be tested first and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves Blameless, blameless. Now, what does that word mean? Because that's a a big word. Blameless is actually a general term, which praise God for that, referring to a person's overall character. It does not mean sinless perfection. Otherwise, there would be no deacons, no pastors, no church members, no nothing. So the character of a deacon is to be a, a sound man. He needs to be someone who walks with God. Your deacon will not be perfect. And by the way, you're organized, and this may be a good time to say, if you do not know who your family deacon is, please send an email to us at info at Stonebridge and say, who's my deacon? And we'll make sure we get it to the deacon so you can know. But your deacons are organized by family ministries, okay? And so each deacon has responsibilities with that. Just so you'll know, your deacon will not be perfect, just like your pastor's not perfect. Your deacon will not be omniscient. He's not going to know everything. Your deacon will not be aware of many things unless you let him know. Did y'all hear that? That's really important in in this day that we live in. It's really important because this is the thing, not just in our church, but in churches all over. And you hear the stories. More and more people will say when they have a need, well, I put it up on Facebook and so no one called me. Well, not everybody's checking Facebook. If you've got a real need, can I ask you to do this? Call your deacon. Let them know specifically, it's, here's what's going on. Could you please pray for me? And I wanted you to be aware. Can we do that? Sure. Oh, amen? Amen. And all the deacons will be very blessed. Your pastor will be blessed, okay? And you'll be blessed. Because then no one assumes incorrectly what's going on, right? Now we know. So this type of testing, you might say, well, what is that? Paul doesn't specify but, but what we can infer from that is that the, the, the person's uh, background, their reputation, their theological positions, their understanding of just the basics and the foundations of our faith would be examined, and they have been. They go through that process, and they have gone through that process in our church. We don't just have a guy that shows up and says, hey, I want to be a deacon, and we go, wow, that's really great. Well, here, we'll have a service for you. Well, these men, they go through a process, and they prove themselves, and they go through a deacon and training process, and in that process, they prove themselves faithful, and we're one of the candidates to have gone through the deacon and training process, and we look at that person and say, wow, 
you know, he, he didn't do anything. We would say, brother, it's not time. Okay? But these men have proven faithful with what's been entrusted to them. So we get to celebrate that. Two brothers who proved faithful with their deacon and training period. The seventh quality is he's to have a godly wife. Now the women kind of get nervous. Verse 11. This verse is speaking about the qualifications of a deacon's wife. According to Paul, deacon's wives must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. So first, what does that mean? Like her husband, the wife is to be dignified and respectable. Second, she must not be a slanderer or a person who goes around spreading gossip, gossip, gossip. Again, my words, I'm sorry. Or slandering. She must carry herself in a dignified manner in a way that honors God. She must be sober-minded and temperate. That means she's able to make good judgment and must not be involved in things that might hinder such judgment, meaning she has self-control. She controls her tongue. Finally, she must be faithful in all things. And you look at that and go, wow. Is everybody faithful? Is anybody faithful in every single thing? Well, this, again, is a broad general phrase that refers, again, like similar to the requirements of an elder, that, that she is to be above reproach in that sense. She is, in other words, to be someone who is walking with God and in her overall character is that of a blessing and a testimony to the Lord at work in her life. Because the reality is, the wife of the deacon has a role in all of this. How she walks with God is important. How she walks with God is important. And so just like a, a pastor or a pastor's wife can't be sowing discord in a church or dividing in a church or, or flying off, thing, all kinds of things, the deacon and his wife were to model those things as well. So we really need your prayers. But guess what? We're human too, and sometimes the flesh <laughs> struggles, and we need those prayers. And so pray for the deacon, pray for his wife. Because ideally, you should be able to look at us and see a model of some sorts. That's something we, 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 we know when we go into this. So your prayers are very much needed. The eighth qualification, the deacon is to be the husband of one wife. Now, this is a very difficult Thing to interpret in the Greek, but the best way to, I believe, to understand this is referring to the faithfulness of a husband towards his wife to be a one-woman man in our vernacular, meaning that he has no other woman he's relating to the way he relates to his wife. Ninth, he must manage his household and children well, verse 12. The deacon has to be the spiritual leader for his family. That's important. In other words, you're not going to be able to serve here if you're not starting at home. So pray for your deacons because they, their first ministry, just like everyone here, their first ministry is in the home, okay? And I know that we, always, we forget that other people have this ministry sometimes, but that's where the first ministry is. So Max's first ministry is at home to Sharon. John's first ministry is at home with his wife as is Matt's, and we go on to everyone else. The same with me, the same with every man here. That's where your ministry starts, okay? But the deacon has to be the spiritual leader of his home. When things get upside down or backwards, that's when all kinds of problems develop. Now, what are the responsibilities of a deacon? Now, you, you, often that's misunderstood, but based on the New Testament and what we've looked at the, at the word, it is to serve. It is to serve, and most of what we see about deacons is really focused on their character. We've already gone through that. I think that the most important thing that we can look at when it comes to this pattern that we see in, in Acts chapter 6 and what we have read in 1 Timothy is to best view deacons as servants who do whatever is necessary to allow the preaching and teaching elders to accomplish their God-given uh, ministry and their calling Again, when all of us are serving out our roles, Christ church sure is beautiful to look at. And deacons are a big part of that. And they need your prayers. They're on the front lines of ministry, ministering to people's practical needs. And that is so very important. We're going to have a time of testimony from our deacon candidates. They're going to answer uh, question as well, and so I'm going to ask if, uh, and I'll get out of the way, and 
uh, Randy, if you would like to come up, and uh, Steve, if you want to come up, we need to, which mic do we need to use? Uh, thankful, he, yes, thankful we have someone who knows microphones better than me, but uh, Randy, why don't you come on up, and this is Randy Foss, if you do not know him, and he serves faithfully in many areas, and Randy, I would like if you'd please share your testimony, and then we have that one uh, simple question we'll ask after that, okay? All right. Well, uh, he already stole my first line. It says, my name is Randy Foss, and this is my testimony. Uh, my father was a career Air Force. Uh, I grew up uh, moving every three years of my life or so. We were hardly ever stationed near our relatives. Uh, my mother was a housewife, uh, so I grew up uh, both my parents in the church, uh, both active. Uh, so my younger brother and I, we were always at church, uh, Sunday services, Sunday school, vacation Bible school, youth group, etc. I was what you'd call a good kid, but, you know, we're not saved by our parents' relationship with Jesus. Uh, we're lost and dead in our sins until you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior. I've always been good with having him as my Savior, it's the having him as my Lord, uh, because then he'd be in control, not me. Uh, I went down the aisle to accept Jesus as my official Savior after VBS one year, uh, and still struggled with him as Lord. Uh, I was always very lone, kind of a loner. Uh, I still play porcupine well. Uh, you, those who know me know I don't like hugs and being around people, uh, but time and again, God has uh, used others in churches to pour into me uh, their gifts, their time, their talents. God uh, started to prompt me to use the gifts he'd given me for the church, even when it didn't seem I could do much more than like stack chairs. Still taking your time means something. Uh, and there's also times God will call you to do things that are completely outside your comfort zone. Um, something you don't feel at all equipped to do in your own strength. But after doing so, those are actually the easiest and best ones because then you've stepped out and trusted God to do it, not in your own efforts or skills to do so. Uh, my relationship has brought me through the storms of life. Uh, I had atheist teachers at my nominally Christian college, but God used them to challenge me to dig into the Bible for myself and find the reasons for the hope within me. Uh, I was active Navy for 24 years. Uh, I moved around a lot, but each time, God plugged me into a church community to grow and serve there. I was actually baptized at my first duty station in the waters of the Indian Ocean at Diego Garcia. And God has continued to transform me over the years through churches. Uh, I'd say I started out a self-serving, career-oriented loner, convinced I needed no one truly close to me, uh, shallow, casual relationships were enough to having a genuine biblical need for community. Um, about 12 years ago, God blessed me with my wonderful wife, Melissa, um, and he continues to grow both of us towards him. Community is not just about what I can get from others, but using our gifts to build one another up. We're shaped by others and their gifts and all drawn together closer toward God. I can't be a lone wolf or decide that someone is unnecessary to the church. Uh, we came to Stonebridge a little over four years ago, and God continues to draw me into service for him. Um, and some of the areas I'm, I naturally go with, I like Bible studies, so I'm working with the men's Bible study. But honestly, children terrify me, and I'm, I've been called to work with Awana since I got here. Uh, so... There's areas that God will call you into, and you think of it's funny that God would use us in that way, but those are the ones that really are the best because, again, God will pour into you more when you're not trying to do it from your own strength. Um, so, again, like Pastor said, don't draw the limits and say, I, I can do these and X these ones off because when you trust him to do it, it'll come out a lot better than if you're doing it from your own strength. See, that, did you get to hear that? And that 
I just said, Lord, wow, God bless you. Now, here's your... And I did hear your sermon last night, so uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> who knows if I cribbed some content. No. All right, Randy, you ready for the big question? We, we, yeah, actually, Mac was joking with him. I think he did. I don't know what he was. He messed with the deacons. He told them they're going to get some really brutal, hard questions today. And, and I think he just now told them today that was just a joke. So, no, this is just a very, this is a simple but important question. What is your understanding of the biblical role of a deacon, and how do you hope to serve the Lord here at Stonebridge? Well, as you said, the biblical role of a deacon is as a servant. Uh, we're not in charge. We're not, uh, I, I will suddenly start ordering people around because that's not how I'm wired anyway. Uh, and I will continue to serve him in the areas he's called me into, uh, the men's Bible study. Somehow he still keeps calling me back to Awana, so still work with the kids, uh, home groups. Uh, but ideally we need to be here, uh, actually continue to be here faithfully each Sunday and pitch in. There's times when there's needs. I, I think last night during service, a couple of the men ran out and changed a tire for someone who's not even part of the church. That's an area of service, and if we hadn't have been here, there would have been people stuck on the side of the road, and this gave them an opportunity to pour into them, and I was still inside. But there are, it, the more of us that are here serving, uh, making ourselves available, uh, the stronger the community will be and the more we can make an impact in the community around us uh, because it's not just about growing us, it's about reaching the lost who are around us. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Randy. <laughs> I know you're por I know. Porcupine quilts. Porcupine hug, right? <laughs> Steve, thank you, Randy. Randy, you can sit, and you can sit with your bride and then we'll call you all up in a moment. This is Steve Graham. Now, you may recognize him as he's, he's up here on Saturdays and Sundays, and Steve has a very gentle heart, and I'm looking forward to you hearing his testimony. I probably took part of your testimony away. This is Steve Graham. Good morning. It's, uh, I'm just truly blessed. We love this church so much, and I'm, I'm blessed to share this with you, the kind of person I am. Uh, I'm, I'm more tend to, I tend more to listen than to speak about uh, myself or anything, so uh, nobody here has heard uh, the story of me, um, but I thought it important to share it. And it's really easy um, to share something like this thinking that you know, I haven't lived as good a life as, as many, many Christians, and that um, you know I'm ashamed of, of the way I have lived in my life. Um, but there is no shame in the power and the love of Jesus Christ to heal and to save us and to continually work in our lives to bring us back to him, always. And so, uh, just a little background. Uh, as a young man, I was, I was fascinated with space. I always wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I loved everything about it. I didn't grow up in the church. I had Bible stories, and, and that was about it. And so, but everything I, I did was, was focused on, on flying, uh, Civil Air Patrol, getting my pilot's license uh, early. I applied to one college. Uh, that was the, the Air Force Academy. I don't recommend applying to only one college. But, um, but fortunately, I did everything I, I had to to be accepted there. Um, that didn't turn out to be a great time. And it, it, it turned in, into a, a very dark time in my life. And when I was done there and moved to Pensacola, um, that's when, when I found God. And uh, a young friend of mine, uh, a roommate, um, led me to the Lord, and it really pulled me out of a very dark time in my life. Uh, led me on a path to meet Annette, and, and I was surrounded by a, an amazing group of young uh, single college people, and we spent all our time together and grew in, in the Lord. Um, after my flight training and, and um, when I, I was selected to fly the B-1 in the Air Force, uh, I went to my qualification in that, and then came back to Pensacola. Annette and I were married, and uh, immediately we went to Rapid City, uh, South Dakota. Now, when, as, as part of the Air Force, that was immediately something, even as a new Christian, I put on a pedestal, being, being in that service, doing what I was doing, flying that airplane. And my first combat squadron, um, 
It was a true warrior ethos. It's, it's hard to explain the, the culture, um, but I really want to focus on that because we've been talking a lot about cultural Christianity lately. Um, and the culture is, they had a, a stupid little saying that went, uh, work hard, play hard. And so we studied, we flew, we, um, we competed against each other. Um, and then on Fridays, we had a thing called a roll call where we would get together in the bar and we would tell our, um, tell stories of the week, all the stupid things we'd done and, and the way to make it better in the future. We compared all our bomb scores, um, you know, and, and who had the, who dropped the best bombs for that week. And, and so those Friday afternoons, um, you know, I, that, I just grew into that culture. And so those Friday afternoons until six o'clock turned into Friday afternoons till 10 o'clock. And then it was Thursdays and Fridays. And then it was Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. And, and then I was drinking a lot at home um, and, and not shepherding my family. Um, and it was very difficult for, for people to see Christ in me in those days. Um, I pursued all my upgrades early, um, went to instructor uh, upgrade as soon as I could, and then 9-11 happened, and that just, that just ramped up my desire to be a, a warrior. And, uh, um, and so at my first opportunity, I applied uh, to the Air Force Weapons School, which is kind of the Air Force version of Top Gun, if you will, um, and was, was accepted. We moved uh, to Abilene in two, um, 2002, and well, we've been in Texas ever since, so praise God. But um, uh, that was a brutal six-month program, um, and I was hardly uh, home to, to care for my family at all. Um, I graduated there, moved through a couple assignments. I uh, grew, grew up in a combat squadron where I was the tactics expert. I was one of the, the leaders of, of the squadron. Um, went on a couple combat deployments and that work hard, play hard attitude continued. Um, uh, and then I was uh, invited back to the weapons school to be an instructor. So that was kind of the, the pinnacle of a combat aviator's uh, time. Um, I was esteemed by my colleagues. I was uh, doing great things with the program. I, I was in charge of one part of the syllabus where we were doing things the B1 had never done before. Um, I was getting excellent ratings on my uh, performance reports, and I thought I'd, I just made it, you know. And, and so I put up another pedestal, and I stepped squarely on it. Um, my pride was, uh, was through the roof. Um, in, the, in that program, uh, we were part of the, the main weapon school was at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. And uh, so we spent a lot of time there. And that old saying about Las Vegas is, is really a lie uh, from the pit of hell because sin resides in the heart and you take it with you wherever you go. And the more, I had never, um, as a young Christian, been like Daniel in exile and set that line that I would never cross. And so, when you step over that line of, of disobedience to God, it's easier and easier to take those next steps. Um, and so eventually, living more and more uh, out, outside of God's will, um, my life just became a life of, of sin, of drunkenness, of deceit, and eventually of adultery. Um, but God is good. God is faithful, and he, uh, that pedestal I was standing on, he um, not so gently pulled the rug out from underneath it. Um, he put me in my place. Um, I was reprimanded. I was removed from uh, my duties as an instructor at the weapons school. I was assigned to another squadron, and immediately God gave me a way back to him. He put, he put commanders in my path that would study the word with me, they would pray with me. I mean, these were, as a young major, and these were colonels pulling me into their office and praying with me. Um, and then God has a sense of humor, and it, very shortly after, he deployed me to the Middle East. That was actually a blessing. Um, it was a time to heal for Adette and I. Uh, kind of the war was, was kind of quiet then, and so um, 
we spent hours a day messaging back and forth, communicating and healing and uh, knowing each other again. And, and uh, Annette always, always said she knew the man I was when we were married. And God knew my heart always as well. Um, and so, uh, very Christ-like, she, um, her forgiveness was a huge blessing to me as well. And despite everything, uh, we try to hide from God. He knows us. He knows us inside and out. Um, so, in my repentance and brokenness, I, um, I began growing again in faith and obedience to the, to the Lord. I continue to work hard in the Air Force um, to redeem myself. And now looking back, I know that I was still, I was still worshiping at the altar of the Air Force. I was, I was still trying to do everything I could to salvage that uh, and make a career of it. Um, God uh, changed that for me as well. And so there was a forced drawdown um, in 2011. Uh, I'd been denied promotion, and it was an easy choice for the Air Force to, to show me the door. Um, and so, uh, in the years after I separated from the Air Force, I, I still wouldn't let it go. And I knew God was calling me somewhere else, um, really, really trying to get me to focus on him, to focus on my family, um, but I, I, I just wouldn't. And so I pursued the reserves in the National Guard. I worked for five years to get into the National Guard. Um, and through that time, that was... Uh, the resolution came after I'd been to Stonebridge where, where, you know, I actually learned how to pray, how to focus on God. And, uh, and so I'd been praying massively. And the day I received the letter that denied me reentry into the National Guard, it's the most peace I've ever had. Because I, I knew it was God's decision for me. Um, So I'll close with this, sorry. Uh, almost two years ago, April, well, just over two years ago, April 27, 2019, uh, I was here at Stonebridge. Uh, Kirk was ordained as a deacon that day. And I took notes in my notebook, as I usually do as pastor, uh, gave the message. He gave it on 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. And the bookmark in my notebook has never left that page. Um, I pray over it constantly not even thinking about uh, being a deacon, those qualifications are really qualifications to be a child of God, uh, to be a good Christian for anybody. And I prayed over those. But the very first note in that sermon, um, you actually said it today again, pray where you can be serving. And I did. Um, when you combine those two things, though, God has <laughs> a way of, of answering prayer. And so um, I am, uh, you've, you've heard about my life. I'm um, very humble about um, being a deacon, but more it's about um, being obedient to God. He called me. Um, I knew when I, was, um, when I was told I was nominated and asked to be a deacon, I knew it was God's answer to my prayers of where I should serve and the kind of man I should be. Um, so I'm just so grateful that God, God brought us here to Stonebridge. My, uh, my family has grown so much. I saw my sons accept Christ at this church and be baptized here. And that's one of the greatest things. Thank you. When you get quiet and you listen, the Lord is an amazing God. And there are stories you've heard tonight, today, and there are stories you have not heard that are here all over. Stories, people watching. Our God is still in the business of saving and transforming. And I'm just going to tell you this, and I'm, this was, if you were, wait, wait, I'm supposed to ask your question, right? But I know that. But I feel it's very important, if you do not know where you stand with Christ, whether you're here or you're watching, 
Or if you're wondering, Lord, I've drifted off somewhere because I, I know those prodigal areas very well myself. And Lord, can you actually, will you welcome me home? If you want to know more about that, just please send that email to us at info at stonebridgesa.com. Let's set a time to talk and pray because our God is good. And Steve, I want to thank you for sharing. Now, that simple question is, is that what is your biblical understanding of a deacon and how do you hope to serve, a role, serve out that role here at Stonebridge? Um, the, the deacon serves Christ's church. He's a partner in ministry to the pastors by proclaiming the gospel. And then the deacon um, is an example of a maturing faith and walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.